Israel, Eretz Yisrael. So um, we're taking more trips to places we're dreaming that we're going to go in person with Mike one of these seasons. <laughs> we had actually planned, Rabbi, I think we had talked like two years ago. I know. We thought this was, we were going to be here in Central Europe in May, I think, or June or whenever it was. What can I say? We're not even like in our own building yet. We're at home We're doing everything. All services are still virtual. And so we'll start with this and oh, welcome everybody. Good morning. Have your coffee as we're going to go to Budapest today or Vienna. We are starting with Budapest and we're going to go to Vienna because, and I, I assume right now you can see my screen. Yeah. Yes. We're going to, um, but next week is Vienna, right? Well, yeah, I originally way back when, when I put this together, I thought I would be audacious and do a, a session of Budapest and Vienna. I mean, how much is there to talk about? I mean, an hour, an hour and a quarter. Come on, Jewish story. Well, it turns out there's a lot more there. And the link, of course, between them is Theodor Herzl, born in Vienna, born in Budapest, sorry. He then moves to Vienna as a, a late teen before he reaches the age of 20 with his family, spends much of his well much he dies at 44 in 1904 but his formative years are between budapest and vienna and then we'll see next week when we're in uh, vienna part how he's a correspondent for a viennese newspaper and he is sent to paris to see the trial of alfred dreyfus and the rest as we say is in history but is jewish memory anyway we're going to budapest today are we ready rabbi you give me the go um well yes i think more people may log on but we have a lot now so let's start Good. And at the end, we'll have, please put your Q&A in the chat, your questions or whatever. And at the end, of course, uh, I'll be back to answer them. But I'm going to take stop my video so I'm not distracting. And uh, we look forward to the, another fantastic hour with you. So here we thank, go. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. And do me a favor, Rabbi, if there is a problem, just unscreen. I mean, open your screen up so I can see and wave to me or send me a message or something like that. All right, I will some... do that. So welcome to Central Europe. I know a lot of people think it's Eastern Europe, but Central Europe. When one goes to great European capitals, you oftentimes look at these amazing buildings and say, wow, you know, but sometimes it's important to realize the context and the period and how they're not even that old. For example, the parliament in Budapest on the Danube on the left-hand side is only from 1896, not that old, versus the Belvedere from the 18th century in Austria in Vienna, on the right, which is a very, very important art museum, which we'll visit a little bit together next week. We're going to Budapest first. And as always, I begin with a story, and that is the story of Hungarian Jewry. How did and when did Hungarian Jewry come to Hungary? And for those who remember, I think we've done some travel journeys in the past. It was a while ago. But when we did this, always, I think we went to Poland together, at least in Russia and maybe even Spain. And the question always is, how do Jews get there? And generally, um, similar, by the way, to our family stories in North America, our families left someplace because of persecution, largely, could be Iran in the late 70s, early 80s, it could be the Pale of Settlement we visited last year um, from 1880 to 1914. But Hungarian Jewry comes possibly as early as the Roman period, almost 2000 years old. But we know from the Middle Ages, there were significant Jewish communities there. But for the purpose of our short virtual journey today, I'm going to divide it into four periods. Medieval, really from 1516, for the early 16th century to toward the end of the 17th century. The modern era, up until the 1930s. Uh, the Shoah, the crazy, bizarre, inexplicable, for lack of a better word, period, short period, where Germany occupied, where Germany and Hungary were allies, and then where Germany occupied Hungary, and the horrible, mass murder of a very large number of people in a very short period of time in the summer, spring and summer of 1944. What was the role of the Hungarian Iron Cross in this murder? Different than other places you might have visited with me, particularly Poland or Russia in the past. And of course, what happened after the war? Budapest was the largest Jewish community, um, kind of west of the Soviet Union after the Second World War. Some would say up to 100,000 Jews were there. And there was a very bizarre form of what is oftentimes referred to as goulash communism in, uh, in Hungary. And the question, of course, is what is, the question, what is the situation of Hungarian Jewry today? When one goes to Budapest, you almost always begin with the beautiful view from the fisherman's bastion 
on the Buddha side. So I took this, oh, this is actually an internet picture, but you're standing on the top of the western part of the Danube, the Buddha side, and on the right over there, I'm circling around with the zoom now you can see is the House of Parliament that we saw in our opening slide over there. There are three parts where Jews live. There's Buddha here on the western side of the river, uh, O Buddha, which is a little bit to the right, south of Buddha, but separate town, and then on the other side, Buddha. Uh, sorry, on the other side of uh, of the river, Buddha on this side and Obuda on this side. On the other side over there is Pesht, where most people will stay when they visit the city today. Most of the hotels are there, of course, and the city has not been unified as one city for that long. We'll see that a little bit later. So Jews came when? Probably the Roman period, maybe as early as the year 900, um, as the area was taken over by Magyar today. We'd probably call them Hungarian tribes from Central Asia. They were protected. Us, I should say, were protected during the crusade period very interesting because the crusade started in germany and france and come across europe but in certain communities the jews were protected and as a result jews came from other parts of europe to get that same protection they lived as i said on the uh, at, at that time they lived on the eastern side sorry on the western side i'm wrong here i keep forgetting to change that that should say west of the danube in the area of abuda and buddha and they had privileges granted by the monarchy the 13th century, um, the, the king of Hungary succumbed to the rules of the Pope, forcing the Jews to wear distinctive, this is the Fourth Lateran Council, distinctive Jewish clothing, weren't allowed to hold any public office. But then a few years later, another king, Bela, rises. He brings in more Jews. He realizes it's good for his economy, actually, and even more Jews are coming in. But by the 14th century, we see Jews who refuse to convert are exiled and return four years later. When I put the slide together, actually, I was looking at it today, and I highlighted the yellow to give you a sense of how this one story of about 500 years of Jewish life in one community is very similar to the stories we've seen together in other parts of Europe and in other places we'll visit in the next four weeks. They were settled here. Why? Because we were invited in or allowed in, and we were protected in one period. We had privileges, but then we were discriminated against over here limited as to what we could do, told what we had to wear. More Jews were brought in, more Jews were kicked out, more Jews were brought in, forced to convert, exiled, but returned later. And this up and down of Jewish life in Europe is by and large a story that put a different title up top. It could be of uh, Poland or of Russia. Very, very, very similar story. And basically serving or, or, or being there at the beck and call and the whim of whoever the monarchs were. Um, in terms of uh, a little bit later from that, interestingly enough, um, what is Budapest today was under Ottoman Turkish rule for almost 150 years, more than, sorry, 160 years. And it was interesting because this was the only, um, uh, this was the only Ashkenazi community under Sephardic rule. Kind of interesting to say the least. There were Jews, however, also came from Spain post, and, and Portugal post-1492 and 1497. And by the 17th century, it became a center of Jewish life. Why? Because of the tolerance given to us by the Ottoman Sultan, in contrast to the persecution we faced under Christian monarchs in, uh, in, uh, throughout Europe. Ashkenazi Jews, as I mentioned before, were the only uh, major non-Sephardic community under Ottoman rule. Turks in general, Muslims in general, I think it's fair to say, were more tolerant than Christians, not just there, but in other parts of, uh, of country. There weren't blood libels. There was no anti-Jewish violence. However, all good things come to an end. And in September 1686, Hungarian and Austrian troops broke through the city's Vienna Gate and massacred most of the Jews where? In the Great Synagogue on the Buddha side, east of the river. Why? Because they saw that we had allied with the, um, since we had allied with the Ottomans, therefore we were the bad guys, therefore our end um, was nigh. And so once again, Things turned south for the Jews. 1703, Buda and Pest, the two major cities, are classified as royal free boroughs, as a result of which Jews weren't allowed to live in them. However, areas adjacent, like Obuda, I mentioned a few minutes ago, which were not considered royal free boroughs, but were rather on private land owned by Hungarian nobility, allowed us to settle there. So by 1726, Jews are brought back once again into what we call Budapest. Relative autonomy there, and it's this bizarre reality. You know, it's like you live in one neighbor, you live in the city, Los Angeles, 
or you live in the valley. And in the city, you're not really, well, Jews aren't allowed to live, but in the valley, Jews are allowed to live. That's how close these places are. Buddha and Obuda are adjacent, and both of them are across the river from Pest on the eastern side of the river. So they were pretty much autonomous. They were on equal footing, and they could even occasionally cross the river and do some commerce in the big market in the Pest side. However, all of this changes in the late 18th century when Emperor Joseph II issued reforms which changed the nature of Jewish life across the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And this edict of toleration um, is quite widespread in the area of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It is not a full emancipation, but it was an act more than anything else to um, give us greater rights, allowing us to work in factories, join guilds, studying local schools, learn the language of the country. The bizarre thing of a thousand years of Jewish life in Christian Europe was that oftentimes the regulations seem very bizarre that we weren't even allowed to learn the local language to integrate with people. Didn't have to wear a distinguishing item of clothing. And as they say, it wasn't a full act of granting of full equality, but rather was an attempt to modernize this Austro-Hungarian empire more than necessarily love to the Jews. I'm almost done with it. Ooh, what did I just do there? Sorry. I'm almost done. Did I do that? Yes. I'm almost done with the history, and then I go into a lot more pictures. Now, this is a time I've talked previously about the one-two punch of emancipation and enlightenment. Um, I think we visited, and correct me if I'm wrong, Rabbi, last year we visited Berlin together. You know, we're, we're visiting Berlin later. I, I can't remember. But when we talk about how Moses Mendelssohn, uh, early, uh, mid-18th century, engages in conversations with the intellectual elites in Berlin, this process of enlightenment that Europe experiences into which Jews are invited has massive change in the Jewish world, followed a century later like this by the rights of uh, not necessarily full emancipation, but rather by these edicts of toleration, which eventually go to emancipation. In the wider global context, remember, 1782, 1783, it's just a few years after something called the United States is formed. It's less than a decade after the French Revolution. So all these ideological changes are impacting Jewish life in different ways across Europe. So what happens? Jews were finally allowed to move east of the river into the Pest side, only when the Count allowed them to move into his buildings toward the end of the 18th century. And what's interesting is that some of the Hungarian aristocracy, but not all, opened the doors by allowing Jews to live there into what would eventually become a very rapidly growing community in an area called the Judenhof, the Jewish courtyard. It is again today where the, if those of you who have been to Budapest you know the Doheny synagogue and the other synagogues we'll see in a few minutes time on the eastern slash pest side of the river. And ultimately that late 18th century settlement became the foundation of the future acculturated, assimilated Jewish community that grew rapidly in the, in the 19th and 20th century. And by 1840, we're allowed to live anywhere. Jews were very involved in the 1848 national uprising, um, where there was an attempt of Hungary to create its own entity with, separate from Austria. And what was amazing was that a short 50 years after Jews are, not even eight years after Jews are allowed to live anywhere in the capital, in Budapest, and Hungary, to put it in context, at least 10% of the population lives in Budapest. It's a small, it was bigger then, but it's a small country. Um, in, in, it's pretty much the same size population as Israel. But the Jews, given the right to be like everybody else, saw themselves as Hungarians or Magyars of Jewish faith and really, really saw themselves as an integral part of Hungarian society. 1859, 11 years after the revolt, a big Doheny synagogue was opened. Uh, Tobacco Street synagogue was opened. It's still there. We'll see it in a few minutes' time. And it's one of the top sites, by the way, to visit in the city. The dual monarchy was established 1867. The Jews, the, the year that the Jews were finally not just tolerated, but emancipated, given full equal rights in the empire. This was the year that Theodor Herzl was all of seven years old. And then something fascinating happened. We'll see it in a few minutes time. In 1868, the Hungarian government asked the Jewish community to convene a Congress to determine what should be the nature of representation between the Hungarian, between Hungary and the Jewish community? Fascinating piece 
We'll see that in a few minutes' time because, as you can guess, there was not one clear Jewish response to that invite. And what happens by 1873 is all three of those areas, Buda and Abuda on the western side of the river and Pesht on the eastern side of the river are all part of one city. Let's see some of the sites now. We've got some of the history behind us. And again, I never suggest that in one hour, we're going to be in a position where we're going to fully understand uh, Hungarian history or any history of any of the cities that we visit. But I want to understand, I want you at least to leave understanding the complexities and the ebbing and flowing of the uh, situation of the Jewish people, which largely, which exclusively I should say, is a function of the whim of the leaders of those countries. So when things become more democratic, they want the Jews more involved until they become less democratic and more anti-Semitic. And the monarchs, if they're more ideological or religious, are more likely to toughen down and to clamp down on regulations governing the Jews. And when they're less religious or less ideological, they're more open to the Jews. And we see that, as I said, across Europe. 1859, the Jewish community builds this Moorish-style amazing synagogue, which seats up to 3,000 people. It is the second biggest synagogue in the world. I think today it's a synagogue in Manhattan that is a little bit bigger than that. If you've been to your sister congregation in New York City, the Central Synagogue on the Upper East Side, it was built at a, 10 years later, almost an exact replica, at least this part, the facade. It's a really bizarre complex that originally was just this synagogue over here. And then the end of the 19th century, they added a museum, one of the first Jewish museums in the world. Behind there, you can kind of see, and we'll explore it in the next pictures, is a mass grave of 7,000 Jews who died in the ghetto, 44 to 45. Lots of memorials to the Shoah and a martyr synagogue built in the back to Jews who died fighting for Hungary in the Austro-Hungarian Empire in the First World War. And as one walks into this incredible, a beautifully lit, beautifully, very, very colorful synagogue, you're blown away by its enormous architecture. Um, three levels. You see the main level, there's a middle level and an upper level. Again, thousands of people could fit in here. It's so big that it's impossible for the very small Jewish community today to continue to pay to maintain it and have it heated properly throughout the entire year. And as such, they use the smaller martyr synagogue built after the First World War in the back section, except for the high holidays and a few other times they use the big synagogue. Massive structure. And as I say, you don't build a synagogue like that unless you feel very much at home. It's like the Jews in Los Angeles. You don't build an addition to the Wilshire Boulevard Temple that is internationally recognized as an incredible piece of architecture unless you really feel comfortable and safe at home. And the same thing here with the Jews in Budapest in 1859, feeling as comfortable as possible. And as I said, when you go to Budapest today, there are probably more people who visit the Doheny Synagogue. I'm not talking about Jews, non-Jewish, typical visitor to Budapest. They will visit the synagogue more than they'll probably even visit the local cathedral. I've been there, I don't know, eight, ten times by now. I've never visited the cathedral, albeit I'm always going with uh, Jewish groups, but it's not as spectacular. It's a beautiful dome and everything, but it's not nearly as spectacular as the Doheny Synagogue. Um, as I said, this is it in its earlier stage, late 19th, early 20th century picture I found on the internet. And on the right-hand side, you'll see this very powerful Shoah Holocaust Memorial in the back um, that was originally funded, if I'm not mistaken, by Tony Curtis. This weeping willow where people who have relatives who were murdered, Hungarian Jews, um, they can make a donation and have the family name or the individual's name engraved on one of these weeping willows in the backyard sculpture. This is the synagogue. And when you enter it, it goes back in that direction. But this entire building here is that Jewish museum, which was built on the very place of Theodore Herzl's birthplace. And there's a sign as you walk up the stairs that says, here was the house, sorry, this is outside. Here was the house where Theodore Herzl, the founder of political Zionism was born. That's me. There's a bust of Herzl where his house was. I'm wearing Herzl socks. That's why I'm showing them off. But here, more importantly, perhaps, is the a view from just in front of the Arona Kodesh, spectacular synagogue, as I say, built by Jews who felt, I would say, as comfortable in Budapest in 1859, which is incredible. 
because they hadn't been given full rights even in 1859 yet. They weren't full citizens until 1863. They were tolerated and they felt as comfortable as Jews who live in Los Angeles do and create this incredible addition to the Wilshire, Wilshire Boulevard Synagogue. This 1868 invitation was fascinating by the Hungarian government. We've got more autonomy now in the Austro-Hungarian Empire where we've got, you know, the kind of two parallel, but still under Vienna pretty much, but two parallel monarchies within the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Now, there's a significant minority amongst us. Let us have the conversation with this Jewish community over how they want us to engage with them. And so 220 delegates were invited to Budapest and the Hungarian Minister of Religion, non-Jewish guy, Account Er A. Erotvos says the following. Fascinating. I read. The state offers you the opportunity to rule independently in all of your religious matters and determine how you wish to organize and govern your communities by your own ideas and principles, which no other country ever offered your co-religionists. Now, America by that time was a tolerant place. Slavery was still there. Women couldn't yet vote. Again, we're talking 1868. The world was not what it is today. And this was a very genuine and generous offer by Hungary. I have great confidence and trust that freedom will soon bring fruits to your community as it affects favorably all noble ambitions, etc. It is my conviction, I continue, that precisely this freedom granted by the Constitution of Hungary will bind the Israelite citizens to our country, to the homeland in all, our, in all circumstances. It was an attempt by the Hungarian leadership to say to the Jewish minority, a significant minority, listen, Tell us how you want to govern your Jewish life within the context of eventually becoming citizens, tolerated residents, and then less than a decade later, citizens of this country. What's incredible, and it might surprise many of you, is that there was no agreement between the 220 delegates over how a Jew should be defined or how the Jewish community should be related to by the Hungarian government. And so the largest group, was a group called the Neolog. Now, the Neolog is still the largest denomination in Hungary. How do I describe it? It's unique. It's only in Hungary. It's not reform. It's not conservative. It's somewhere between modern Orthodox and conservative, but it's a unique form of Jewish tradition. As I say, unlike any other form in, in the world. Then there was another group, the Orthodox, the autonomous Jewish community. And then there was another group called the status quo group, which wanted to leave things the way it was, as their name suggests, before. In other words, 1868, this unprecedented, and think about it, and we'll talk about this, I'll talk about this next week as well, this meteoric rise of the Jewish community, not being allowed to live on both sides of the river, all of a sudden being allowed late 19th century, late 18th century to move on to the Pesh side as well, 1860, uh, sorry, the late 1700s, so in, in, in 1782, 1783, given this right of toleration, and then 1863, less than a century later, finally given the opportunity to be equal citizens. Pretty crazy when you think about it, because by the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, the Jewish community numbered 20% of the population, about 200,000 of the million people in the city, the unified city of Budapest, were of the Jewish, uh, were, as I say, Magyars or Hungarians of the Israelite or slash Jewish profession, uh, Jewish confession slash faith. This is one of the three, maybe four beautiful synagogues that are there today. The Doheny that we visited beforehand is literally a block away from this neolog Rumbach synagogue, which was built in 1872. Very similar but a little bit different than the one that we just saw the Doheny built 13 years beforehand. You'll see the very heavily Moorish style. I don't know if, I don't know if the original, I've never seen, I've just seen a few pictures of uh, Wilshire Boulevard, the original campus, I don't know when it was built, and maybe you can pipe in on this later, Rabbi. But many synagogues, I mentioned Central Synagogue, I didn't mention the Plum Street Synagogue, the Isaac Weiss Synagogue in Cincinnati, the headquarters of the Hebraian College for many years in America, a number of others at the synagogue in Florence, very similar to the synagogue in Krakow, the temple, um, other synagogues, the Jerusalem synagogue in Prague. These are synagogues that were all built in the second half of the 19th century, the Orenburger Strasse synagogue in Berlin as well on the eastern side, all in this kind of Moorish 
revivalist style, but very Jewish. You can see the Ten Commandments on the top over there, and not a lot of Jewish expression in terms of synagogue architecture. But remember, for almost 1900 years, Jews in Europe, if they were allowed to build synagogues, did not build magnificent edifices. This is a relatively new phenomenon. And try to imagine this synagogue built in a place where a hundred years before, less, Jews were not even allowed to live. So the meteoric rise, the economic ability and the wherewithal, as you look at the indoor picture of the Bima, you'll see at the end, actually, this Rumbach synagogue, um, I've never been in it because it was closed for many, 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 many years. And only in June of last year did the synagogue finally reopen as it was rededicated as a combination synagogue, a cultural center, etc. But very, I mean, obviously, this is redone, you know, post communism. And the question, of course, is, can the community there sustain these amazingly beautiful 19th century structures? It's hard. Obviously, there's not a big community. They don't have a lot of resources. And therefore, when they charge admission and people say, why I'm a Jew, why do I have to pay money to go to a synagogue? Realize that you're paying money in order to maintain these spectacular structures because the local community doesn't have the ability to do that. We talked about two synagogues, 1859, 1872. What's going on with the Jews in the 20th century in Budapest? By the First World War, look at the numbers. 20% of Budapest is Jewish, colloquially um, referred to. Um, there was a mayor of New York a number of years ago who called New York Jaime Town, as New York had about a, what was it, 20, 25% Jewish population. Unfortunately, colloquially, some people referred to not Budapest as Budapest, but Judapest, a very significant Jewish community, very highly educated. Look at the numbers. Over half the merchants and almost half the contractors were Jews in the city. Pretty incredible. Twice to two and a half times, two to two and a half times their representation in the population. And as I mentioned before, many Jews in Budapest didn't see them as Jews in Hungary, but rather as Magyar speaking. Hungarians of the Mosaic faith, of the Mosaic tradition, okay? Um, hundreds of thousands of Jews fought for Hungary in the First World War, 10,000 of whom died. And that synagogue I mentioned, the Martyr Synagogue, was built in their honor. But then after the First World War, the Austro-Hungarian Empire dissolves. Now, I I'm always have this dilemma when I make these presentations about Central or Eastern Europe, how much of the larger history do I go into? Because there's just so much that happened in such a short period of time. And it's important to me always to kind of lay the ground and give the background to what happens up until the modern era. A lot of stuff going on. And Budapest, I would say, of all the places I've, I've, I've taught and I've virtually visited in the past year, year and a half with, with many of you, and we're going to see in the next month or so, Budapest is the most bizarre. And here is one of the reasons why. So Austria-Hungary is, is dissolved after the war. And then there's an attempt in Budapest, in Hungary, to have a Bolshevik slash communist uprising. It's led by a Jew, Bela Kuhn, converted. I mean, he left Judaism to go to Christianity. And then he obviously left that if he's leading a communist revolution. A lot of Jews were involved in this, and it led to this anti-Jewish backslash. We hear this a lot in Europe, right? We hear it in Poland, we hear it in Germany as well. Led to a lot of anti-Semitism, including a limitation to its numerous classes of Jews to study in universities. Many, of course, fled to look for a higher education somewhere else. And think about it. If we're 20% of the population in Budapest, and look at the numbers, half of the merchants and half the contractors, a very educated community, only one out of 20 students in university could be Jewish, a big problem, and led to a Jewish brain drain. After the failed coup, after the failed revolution, there was a Treaty of Trianon, which the first few times I went to Hungary, I never heard of. But in the past five, 10 years, it's becoming quite a popular thing because the right in, in Hungary wants to go back 102 years to this 1920 treaty to restore Hungary to about four times the size of what it is today. And the Treaty of Trianon is a very traumatic event for nationalist Hungarians because what happened was much of what was part of Hungary then was taken away as a result of this treaty. And Admiral, Admiral Horty, a fascist, takes power in 1920, weakens democratic institutions, a theme that we'll come back to later today. And he sought alliances. He wasn't 
a lover of Hitler necessarily, but when Nazi Germany under Hitler said, listen, you join us and we'll bring more areas in Slovakia and Romania and Yugoslavia that you believe are legitimately Hungarian back into your control, then Horthy joined an alliance with uh, Hitler and Nazi Germany. All of this happened in the context of Jewish life. Again, 20% of the city uh, Jewish. Another synagogue, this is the Orthodox or the middle of that group that I talked about, the Neolog, the Orthodox, and the status quo. Again, I've never been into this synagogue. It's a small functioning synagogue, very, very different style. Um, it, it's less to do with the denominations because one would not assume that an Orthodox synagogue would build this very funky Art Nouveau style synagogue. There you can see the uh, the Ten Commandments, and they're all within about a square block of the Doheny Synagogue. This one functions um, as a synagogue for a small Orthodox community. The previous one, the um, uh, the synagogue that I just showed you, built in 1872, just reopened, as I said, serves as a small synagogue, but more than anything else as a community center, the Rumbach Street, and of course the Doheny is the center, really, of the Jewish community, not just in Budapest, but in Hungary. So. We've got this crazy blossoming growth of success in many ways of the Jewish community or the Magyar speaking Hungarian of Mosaic faith community. And then we've got after the First World War, this anti-Semitic backlash after this perceived Jewish led failed communist revolution and the rise of a fascist regime, regime under Admiral Horthy. What's fascinating about Hungarian Jewry, one of the biggest and most significant Jewish communities before the war was the incredible creativity of, uh, of this community. And one of the books that I went to the first time I was in, in Budapest, my friend now and colleague at the time, uh, local Jewish tour guide said, you got to read this book. So I bought the book on Amazon on Kindle. I read it half of the bit when I was there. And it's fascinating. It's written by Katie Martin, who was married to Peter Jennings, I think, and then divorced and married the diplomat was named Richard Holbrook, if I'm not mistaken. Fascinating story. She was born in Budapest herself. Um, she was actually hidden by her parents. She was supposedly a Catholic, but she was not actually. She found out later that she was Jewish. And um, fascinating story. Her parents were in prison for two years, accused of spying on behalf of the Americans. Anyway, she writes this amazing book about this creative, and, I, and this is a quote from her, and I'll read the whole thing because it really gives us an insight into the richness and the breadth and depth of Jewish life there before all of this happened. Who were these men and where did they come from? Was it simply a coincidence that they were from such a strange little country with a language incomprehensible to the rest of the world? Or was there something peculiar about that country and that city at that time that created in so many different fields, so many unusual people, Sillard, Teller, Wigner, along with other genius in Budapest, John Van Neumann, brought to America more than the physics revolution. Having saved themselves from Hitler, they were determined to alert the new nation, America, to the mounting danger. Buffeted by every political upheaval of the century, the four scientists were in the vanguard of an early warning system. Writing in vastly different fields, they tried to rouse a world still averting its gaze from the gathering storm of Nazism and fascism across Europe. As the scientists pushed for the atom bomb, Arthur Kessler was writing Darkness at Noon, Michael Cortez was making Casablanca, Robert Capo was making the immortal pho photographic record of the helpless victims of Franco in Spain. These are some of the greatest creators of the mid 20th century, all of whom fled Hungary because of what was going on once Horthy took power in 1920. The, in journal, the incredible journey of nine men from Budapest to the New World, how they strove and what they learned along the way, and the imprint that they made on America and on the world. I couldn't put it in better words, and therefore I quoted her. And one more quote from Katie Martin, this book, which is now, I think, 15, 18, whatever, 20 years old. These nine men were Jews in a city that briefly welcomed and encouraged their ambition. Remember that brief window, late 19th, early 20th century. Unlike the Jews of Russia and Romania, Budapest Jews were integrated in the city's great academic and cultural, though not political institutions. Budapest, like New York, Paris, and Berlin, became a magnet for the brightest from all over the region. The multi-ethnic cauldron of the empire in its closing years helped to ignite creative explosions in both Budapest and Vienna, which we'll see next week. It is no accident that another secular Jew, Theodor Herzl, born in Budapest in similar circumstances only a few years earlier, created modern Zionism out of the ferment of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So 
crazy, very short period, amazing creativity, amazing Jewish contribution, and then they escaped, thankfully, before they were murdered. They would have been murdered by the Germans and their Hungarian accomplices. Horty, the fascist dictator in, uh, in Hungary, issues a series of anti-Semitic laws, like the Nuremberg laws, but interestingly enough, he doesn't deport the Jews. Tens of thousands, maybe 25,000 lost their lives, in, uh, went to the Soviet front in work brigades, but he doesn't deport the Hungarian Jews. By the spring of 44, however, most Jews under Nazi occupation and Nazi uh, rule or alliances in Europe were sent to be murdered. But on March 19th, Nazi Germany invaded Hungary. Why? Because Horthy wanted to be as neutral as possible. He thought that the war was rapidly approaching its end. Remember, D-Day is only three months later, right? March to June. An SS team led by Adolf Eichmann came to Berlin. They forced Jews to wear the Yellow Star on April 5th. Deportation of Jews from rural areas, not Budapest, began on May 15th. And by early July, crazy, when Horthy suspended the transports, 434,351 Jews were sent to Auschwitz-Birkenau. By late June, Jews were forced to live in almost 2,000 of these yellow-starred houses that have a yellow star on the outside of them. A ghetto wasn't established until a little bit later. Eventually, though, Horthy realizes that this isn't good, and he stops the transports. And it's at that time that a report of two Slovakian Jews, Rudolf Verba and Rudolf Wetzler, reaches President Roosevelt, who then communicates to Horthy that it would be, if it was, if Jews were to be sent out from Budapest, he, as the leader of Hungary, would be held responsible. The Nazis get rid of him, and they put in charge a fascist government under the Arrow Cross, and very quickly they launched this unprecedented killing spree along the Danube River, river killing thousands, literally taking Jews out of their home, shooting them on the side of the river, and throwing them in the river. Um, the ghetto was established by this Arrow Cross regime in November, Another ghetto you'll see in the next slide is set up this international ghetto uh, of buildings controlled by neutral governments, Swedish, Swiss, Italian, etc. Um, up to 20,000 Jews um, lived in those buildings. It's this bizarre, bizarre situation where Polish Jewry and almost and French Jewry, almost everybody else is already sent to Auschwitz. They send almost half a million Jews in six weeks from rural Hungary, and then they stop. And what's amazing is that a lot of people say, well, Horthy didn't really have any opportunity to resist. He did. He forced, he said, don't send any Jews out of Budapest. He could have maybe have said the same thing. Don't send Jews out of rural Hungary. And there's a lot of talk within Hungary today that A, he was a hero from the political right, and B, he was nothing more than an accomplice to the Nazis who, had he wanted to have resisted sending out half a million Jews from rural Hungary, could possibly have done so as well. Here's the map I was promising you about. This is the area established in November of 44, the ghetto. Those are the synagogues in here. We talked about there's uh, one of the synagogues, the Doheny synagogue over there. The other two, uh, the Rumbach and the other one that, that I just showed you are just uh, over there. And then uh, about a mile and a half, maybe two miles north over here, the international ghetto where there are lots of buildings owned by or leased by foreign governments. That's where Raoul Wallenberg um, operates out of. And there are lots of these protected houses in which Jews are kept from the moment the ghetto was established in November of 1944. There's a picture I just found on the internet. Uh, There's a project, by the way, Google, Yellow Star Houses Budapest. They have a, a, a picture on their website of all the houses, the apartment. And a house, don't think of a house, a single family dwelling. Think of a five, six story building in which hundreds of families might have lived. Yellow star on it, Jews lived in this building. And as I mentioned, I'm already in the summer, early fall of 1944, the arrow crossed the fascist Hungarians, took Jews out of their homes, shot them um, and threw them into the frozen in the winter Danube River. All this takes place, you'll see where exactly in a minute. Um, here is the statue with the last group I had there in the area dedicated to Raoul Wallenberg, saving thousands and thousands of Jews. And here is another angle that very, very powerful, one of the more powerful memorials I know of in Europe, right in front of this building, which you might recognize from my first slides of the Hungarian parliament. Here is a country, here is its capital city, Budapest, where Jews lived, significant percentage of the community contributed 
to the city and to the national effort on so many levels. Yet anti-Semitic policies in the 20s and 30s, cooperation with Nazi Germany and Hungarian fascists per willingly participate in the murder of Jews. Where? Right in front of the House of Democracy, the beautiful 1896 Budapest or Hungarian um, parliament. What happens after the war? Crazy numbers, up to 100,000 Jews survive in Budapest. Um, it should be said that 80,000 Jews were murdered, taken from Budapest, killed in Budapest as well. But Budapest, as I mentioned earlier, had the largest Jewish population in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, it was not easy, though. A lot of intermarriage and baptism because it was very hard to have two couples, to, two spouses, both Jewish in a very anti-Semitic communist uh, government. There was, the, there was the uprising, of course, in 56. Bizarrely, even under communism, the rabbinic school continued to create rabbis, state rabbis, for all of the communist bloc. Very bizarre to even think about this, but there were very few. You know, every major city had its one synagogue. But then, with the fall of the Iron Curtain in the late 1980s and the end of Soviet rule, there was this new process of Hungarian Jews looking for a new identity. Because remember, 100 years ago, 1880s, Hungarian Jews, as I mentioned, saw themselves as Magyar-speaking Hungarians of the Mosaic tradition. You know, are you American Jews or Jewish Americans? And you can answer differently. And at different times, you feel differently about that. But there's no question that late 19th, early 20th century, Hungarian Jews were very happy with the opportunity to be equal to everybody else and rose to that occasion. And were involved in all the professions and went to the universities until they were limited. But now what happens? Those who did survive the Holocaust then survived decades of communist trauma. There are not a lot of Jewish men around. And how do you identify religiously in a place where religion is really, hasn't really played much of a role? And therefore, I think it's fair to say that that very large Jewish community, maybe three to 4,000 active members, maybe 10 to 12,000 define themselves as Jewish, but you can be talking about 150, to 200,000 Hungarians who had a Jewish grandparent. But they define themselves, or they identify, I should say, much more culturally and historically. So a meteoric story in about 45 minutes or so, we take the last 15 minutes to look at some of the, I think, most difficult dilemmas and challenges that one faces when one goes to visit wearing Jewish lenses in Budapest. And this section, I talk about the perpetrators, the bystanders, and the upstanders. Who were the perpetrators of the Shoah? No question the Nazis, not all the Nazis, not all the Germans, but what about the Hungarians? Were Hungarians perpetrators? Were some Hungarians perpetrators? It's a big dilemma and a big discussion that takes place in one of the most important squares in the city of, of Budapest today. It, this memorial erected not even 10 years ago, officially called the Memorial for Victims of the German Occupation. In the back over there is a statue of Ronald Reagan, to the right over here is the American Embassy, Victory Square. It's a very, very important square in, in, in the city. And the art, bizarrely, shows the German eagle sweeping down on Hungary. There's the angel of Hungary. There's the orb of the symbol of Hungary that essentially tells the story of this is a memorial for victims of the German occupation. It's not a memorial for the Jews murdered. It's not. It is for the German occupation. And it was put up literally overnight by the current president, uh, Viktor Orban. And you'll see in front of it, much to the opposition of the Jewish community and many others in Hungary, this kind of makeshift memorial of Jews and non-Jews protesting the fact that this was a country in which huge numbers of Jews were sent out largely by Hungarian Arrow Cross who cooperated willingly with the Germans. And so it's a scene of lots of protests, um, very bizarre. The perception as you walk up to this is that this is a memorial dedicated to this dark period in which Nazi Germany swooped down and took over Hungary, rather than this bromance between Horthy and, and Hitler that had been from 1933, really, until the Nazi leadership came in, in the fall of 1944, in the, sorry, in the spring of 44 with Eichmann, and then afterwards in the summer, installing a fascist Hungarian regime that pretty much did what the Nazis wanted them to do. And look at some of the pictures. For example, here are the Iron Cross arresting a Jewish man, right? This is the Hungarian fascists. You're not 
I mean, there were people who cooperated in France, not in Poland, but definitely in France. And look at the Nazi officials with the Hungarian officials as well. They were one and the same, by and large, a large level of cooperation between the Iron Cross and the government starting in the summer of 1944. The second element of this very bizarre period is more than perhaps any other community in Europe, we know the story of a number of very important people, Raoul Wallenberg, of course, and famous people, I should say, who were very involved in rescuing Jews. One thing you might have not have heard of is the Swiss vice consul, Karl Lutz. He worked with the Jewish agency, got false papers, and allowed help Jews cross international borders, arranged safe houses in the international ghetto. Um, and actually, you'll see in the next picture, there was this glass factory in which he issued thousands and thousands of these documents that was where his office was there's this bizarre sculpture in uh, in the jewish area around the corner from the doheny synagogue where you see this image of this golden angel where is it over here sorry um on the ground there is a person sticking their hand out and opposite that person on the wall you can see is this hand with a golden angel appearing to hold his lifeline to people down below like where I'm standing when I took this picture, my colleague Aggie is about where this, right, where this uh, this piece is over there. Um, and then there's a sign which says in English, whoever saves a life is considered as if he has saved an entire world. It comes from the Talmud. And then underneath it, this memorial put up in 1991 says, in memory of those who in 1944, under the leadership of Swiss consul Karl Lutz, rescued thousands from national socialist persecution. Hmm. National socialist, that's Nazi. Doesn't mention at all the Hungarian perpetrators through the iron through the arrow cross, right? We're talking just about the National Socialist perpetrators, right? Amazing, this guy saved sixty thousand Jews. No, very little name recognition. In contrast to the, uh, in, in sharp contrast to Raoul Wallenberg, who will meet in a few minutes' time. Uh, Fifteen years later, in two thousand and six, there is a, another memorial for Karl Lutz that is set up in this book outside the American Embassy, and here is the quote. I added this this morning because you cannot read this. I can read it in Hungarian and in English. In the building, Swiss Vice Consul Karl Lutz honorably represented the interests of the United States of America and other countries between 1942 and 5. He courageously saved the lives of tens of thousands of Hungarian citizens persecuted as Jews. Very, very different language than we saw in the previous one. Again, it doesn't mention the Hungarian fascists but very, very different than the language of the previous 1991 one that says quite clearly, rescued thousands from national socialist persecution. And it's fascinating because this one was put up by the American embassy, um, tells a story, all memorials, all buildings, all structures tell different stories, depending on the aim of the people or the group that wants to set up that structure. Here are pictures from outside of this glass house, this glass factory, there it is on the right, and look at the throngs of people who are coming to get these false papers that allow them refugee status and, and passage outside of Hungary. All of this happening in this bizarre period, and just try to contextualize it, right? Here is this massive community, up to a million Jews living in what was Hungarian-controlled Hungary at that point. 435,000 are sent out from May until early July. July 6th, the fascist dictator Horthy stops the, uh, the deportations before Hungarian Jewry is sent out. He is replaced by a, uh, by a Hungarian fascist government, which then in November sets up a ghetto. Between July and November kills tens of thousands of Jews, sends them out to camps, but ultimately still a very large number of Jews are, are survive. Why? Largely because they're hidden in these safe houses under Lutz, under Wallenberg, under Vatican represented many, 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 under a, a Spanish consul as well, many, many people saving thousands and thousands of lives. And the bizarre thing is that when you think of how these papers were forged, why didn't the Nazis realize, or the Hungarian fascists realize what was going on and step in? They were kind of looking the other way in, in many ways. Wallenberg, we've all heard of. We don't know when he dies. He disappears shortly after the Red Army occupies Budapest. But... He joins Roosevelt's refugee board in 44 to help civilians under Nazi occupation. He came from a very wealthy, one of the wealthiest still to this day, the Wallenberg family in Sweden, brought 600 passports with him, 
First, he wanted to send a train of orphans to Sweden. Then he gave them protective, protective passes, pretty much shooting in all directions. I mean, figuratively, he didn't have a gun, in all directions to try to do what he possibly could to save Jews. He then tried to get into the protective houses. He had 10,000 Jews in 32 houses. He literally stopped trains and pulled Jews off the trains when transports began in the fall of 44. And then no one what happens to him once he's arrested by the Russians in July of 1945. Listen to one of the Hungarian drivers who worked with Wallenberg. He climbed up on the roof of the train and began handling in passes through the doors, which were not yet sealed. He ignored orders from the Germans to get down. Then the Aircross men began shooting and shouting at him to go away. He ignored them and calmly continued handing out passports to the hands that were reaching out for them. I believe the Arrow Cross men deliberately aimed over his head and not one shot hit him, which would have been impossible otherwise. I think this is what they did because they were so impressed by his courage. After Wallenberg handed out the last of the passports, he ordered all those who had one to leave the train and walk to the caravan of cars parked nearby, all marked in Swedish colors. I don't remember exactly how many, but he saved dozens off that train. And the Germans in the Arrow Cross were so dumbfounded that they helped him, they let him get away with it. There's nothing that I have yet found rationally to explain why somebody in the German or in the Nazi or in the Hungarian leadership just didn't put a bullet in the head of Wallenberg and end him or Karl Lutz. I mean, did they realize by this point already after D-Day that the tide was beginning to turn? Did they want to see if they could save something of what they had done? Perhaps the most famous Israeli um, who was saved by Wallenberg, him and his mother, was a guy named Tommy Lapid. He was a former journalist and uh, politician. His son is Yair Lapid, our foreign minister and next prime minister, hopefully, in November, hopefully if they, the government agrees for this invitation. And he describes what happens to half a million Hungarian Jews sent to Auschwitz. He says, we tend to blame only the Germans for this. But they could not imagine such a, mad, managed such a feat on their own. There were peoples that actively opposed the annihilation, the Danes and Bulgarians, and nations that didn't lift a finger in Belgium. The Hungarians assisted in the extermination of the Jews, often enthusiastically. Until the very last moment, the pro-Nazi government of Sazalai continued to dispatch Jews to the concentration camp by the thousands. I love Hungarian culture, its poetry, and its sausages, but I will never, ever forgive the Hungarians. Raoul Wallenberg was and always will be the proof of that human conscience, like human evil, is likely to pop up in the most unlikely of places. And that's an amazing line because that notion of human evil popping up and also human goodness being able to pop up in the most unlikely of places. And the last quote about Wallenberg is from Hausner, the Israeli um, attorney general and prosecutor of Adolf Eichmann in the Eichmann trial, who describes Eichmann, contrast Eichmann with Wallenberg. Here is a man, Wallenberg, who had a choice of remaining in secure, neutral Sweden when Nazism was ruling Europe. Instead, he left his haven and went on to what was then one of the most perilous places in Europe, Hungary. And for what? To save Jews. He won his battle. And I feel that in this age, in the early 60s, when there's so little to believe in, so very little to which our young people can pin their hopes and ideals, he is a person to show the world. Amazing story of Wallenberg miraculously Bizarrely, I should say, disappears. When I was last there, I discovered in April of, 19, of 2018, I think, there's a new memorial opposite the hotel I was staying to Wallenberg. I couldn't find it on the internet. There's a picture from my camera. There is his attaché case. Do not forget. And what does it say in English? The young diplomat Wallenberg worked in Budapest in 44-5. He issued Swedish protective passes to Jews. Thousands of people were saved through his personal courage, knowledge, and creativity. Wallenberg was born in 1912, etc. He was abducted by the Soviet Red Army. His fate remains unknown. Clearly, it's new. It's obviously post-communism, but I couldn't even find anything about this new memorial, modest, in the center of Budapest. Another famous figure you probably are familiar with from the story of Jewish Budapest is Chana Senesh. This young woman grew up in a well-to-do Jewish family, very integrated in Hungarian society, but joins her sister and moves to the land of Israel. She settles on a kibbutz, kibbutz Stotyam, kibbutz Caesarea, right next to the beautiful site of Caesarea. But in 1942, 44, sorry, she joins a group of three dozen men and women who, with the Palmach, are going to train the Jewish security, underground security in Palestine, to train and jump with the Allies into Yugoslavia to try to tell the Hungarian leadership of the impending doom. Now, 
Nobody suggested this young woman was going to stop the Nazis from sending 434,000 Jews to Auschwitz in the spring summer of 44. But at least to give warning, the word that had gotten out, remember the Ruda, Verba, and Wetzler report that got to FDR already by this time to tell them what much of the world leadership think was going to happen. Eventually, she's captured, tortured, uh, and, and she's hanged in November of 1944. But we know Hannah Senesh, very talented woman whose diary is left to us because of her poetry and her writing, including the famous song, and I can't sing it, Eli, Eli, you're probably familiar, Shaloi Gamer Le'olam, my Lord, O oh God, I pray these things never end. The sand in the sea, the rustle of the waters, lightning of heavens, the prayer of man. As she walked one day along the shore of the Mediterranean, there's a picture of her here, there is Caesarea in the background you might recognize before the archaeological digs. Very proud, very committed to being in Palestine. And she wrote in her diary, one needs something to believe in, something for which we can have a wholehearted enthusiasm. One needs to feel that one's life is meaning, that one is needed in the world. Zionism fulfills this for me. One needs a good many arguments against the movement, but this doesn't matter. I believe in it, and that's the important thing. Beautiful young woman, very spiritual. Um, almost every Israeli teenager has you know, the diary of, or the letters of, or the poetry of Hannah Sanish, and we all sing that song, Eli Eli, at every major memorial uh, in Israel. And of course, she is buried in a military cemetery in Jerusalem on Mount Herzl. Now, Hungary today, as I mentioned, is a Jewish community of 120, 140,000 people, somehow identified with it, on the one hand. On the other hand, Hungary today is a very bizarre place and you see I literally five minutes before I got online I was actually late meeting the rabbi and Hannah um, because I was cutting a picture that came out of today's New York Times an hour ago you'll see it in a minute um, but Hungary is a bizarre place because post 1989 fall of the Iron Curtain it of course opened up um, no more communism and Hungary was always kind of like the Czech Republic pushing the envelope and, and trying to get rid of the yoke of Soviet communist depression. And it's opened up, but yet there's a lot of conservatism inside of Hungary, particularly around the current president, that we'll meet in just a minute, um, um, uh, not president, but Prime Minister uh, um, Viktor Orban. And one of the biggest villains, according to the far political right in Hungary today, is this man you might recognize. This is George Soros, Hungarian born. Um, American, uh, very successful economically, philanthropist, very involved in all sorts of American, European, international, left of center political causes. And when I went in April 2008, I landed at the airport, and there were all these ads everywhere in downtown Budapest. I asked, I don't speak Hungarian, it's one of the most difficult languages that and Finnish in the world to understand. And I was asking what this means. And these are anti Soros ads in an election campaign. Remember, the guy lives in America. He's Hungarian born. But the party of Viktor Orban is very clearly, and here he is on the right hand side. Um, this is a picture I saw, I took on my phone, my little phone, in the King David Hotel lobby on July 19, 2018, two months, three months after I got back from Budapest. There he was visiting they're doing business in Israel, okay? What he calls a champion of illiberal democracy. And he and his party are funding these ads that are essentially saying that this Jewish billionaire, who is in America, is funding all sorts of immigrants to come into Hungary. And you might remember that same or the year before, Angela Merkel, the chancellor of Germany, now the former chancellor of Germany, allows a million refugees, mostly Islamic refugees in the Middle East to come into Germany. And Orban builds a barbed wire fence around the border in order to prevent any immigrants from coming into this country. Okay, so anti-Jewish, call it, ads all across. It sounds a lot like a caveat of wealthy Jews are controlling the politics of another country. That's exactly what it's intended. If you um, are voting for the opposition, you're voting for this guy, in a sense, who's trying to undermine traditional Hungarian values. And then Orban comes to Israel. Remember the date of my picture? My iPhone, July 19th. And seven days later, eight days, sorry, nine days later, he's back in Budapest, and he makes this incredible speech in the parliament. Listen to this. Let us confidently declare that Christian democracy is not liberal. 
And we all talk about liberal democracies. That's not us. Liberal democracy is liberal. While Christian democracy is, by definition, not liberal. It is, if you like, illiberal. And we can say specifically, in this connection, with a few important issues, say three great issues, liberal democracy is in favor of multiculturalism. While Christian democracy gives priority to Christian cultures, this is an illiberal concept. Liberal democracy is pro-immigration, while Christian democracy is anti-immigration. This is, again, a genuinely illiberal concept. And liberal democracy sides with adaptable Christian family models, while Christian democracy rests on the foundations of Christian of the Christian family model. Once more, this is an illiberal concept. He very clearly sees himself as a champion of illiberal democracy, right? Not a big fan of it, of, of what we would call liberal democracy. And although many of us thought the end of history post Cold War, post fall of the of the uh, of the uh, Berlin Wall. It isn't happening in a lot of places, including Hungary, Poland, I would say, maybe Austria as well, where the far right is gaining tremendous strength and publicly admits that we don't actually want to have a liberal democracy. Here, as I mentioned before, I didn't want to end with Orban. Um, and so yesterday I put two slides up here. The dedication, sorry, there it is. The dedication of the opening of the Rombach Synagogue in, uh, in uh, June of just last year. Upstairs, apparently, there's an exhibit in honor of uh, Pulitzer, I didn't realize, Hungarian Jew, as in the Pulitzer Prize, the famous journalist. There is a view from up above where I guess this is part of that exhibit, which I haven't seen yet, of the Rumbach Synagogue. And then an hour ago, literally, I saw this picture online. There it is at eight. So it was 12 minutes before I got online with you. From the New York Times, Orban, Prime Minister of Hungary, is visiting Moscow, accused of stoking acrimony with the EU. The rest of Europe, as we speak, and America, is all anxious about what's going to happen. Is there going to be a war between Russia and the Ukraine? Russia thinks that Ukraine is no, many Russians, including its leader, thinks that Ukraine is no legitimate national self-determination and it belongs to Russia. Russians, Ukrainians, one and the same. And most of the leaders in the world are trying their hardest, whether it's the president of France, Macron, making calls, whether it's the American ambassador delivering a, a document, but yet Viktor Orban says, I'm there, I'm right with my fellow illiberal democratic leader, Mr. Vladimir Putin. And with that, I end. Before I turn to questions in the chat, I want you to realize that the Jewish community today in Hungary is very closely, uh, I don't want to say affiliated in the sense that all Jews are supporters of Orban, far from it. But there's lots of conversation, as there is in Russia, between the Jewish leadership, as there always has been, and whoever is in charge. And even though those, and most of Hungarian Jews are quite liberal, even though the liberal Hungarian Jews are perhaps glad that the government has warm relations to the Jewish minority, they're perhaps challenged, they are not perhaps, they're on the other end challenged by the complexity in which, and the direction in which that illiberal government is going. Because if you take the prime minister's word at, uh, at face value, we're not a liberal democracy. We're a Christian illiberal democracy where Christian values are the values of society rather than universal values. And with that, Rabbi, I've said a mouthful. I turn it over to questions, please. So here's a question. Which denomination is the greatest in Hungary now? Which Jewish denomination? Numerically, the greatest is definitely the neolog. I have been there a few times, which is this unique I don't know how to describe it. It's similar to the um, United Synagogue Orthodox in England, but different in that there's music, um, but there's separation between men and women. How about that? So it's that kind of modern or conservadox. Yeah, it's neolog. It's neolog. bizarre. And every time I like, I try to push my Hungarian friends and colleagues on it, and they're like, well, it's, it's different. It's Hungarian. What do you expect? It's kind of a goulash. It takes, a, as they say, it takes a little bit from here, a little bit from there. Um, there are very small, and I say this about all Jewish communities that I visited, um, I visited in Europe, whether it's Poland, whether it's Berlin, even, there are very small but not insignificant reform and conservative communities that are starting. And in a lot of these communities, particularly those under so former Soviet influence, where there was this one-two punch of Shoah followed by communism, there are very few families where everybody is halachically Jewish. In other words, right. the, the paternal, um, the, the, the 
the orthodox definition of one's Jewish because of one's mother, maternal, sorry, not paternal. And so I, I, on the one end, you would think that these communities are ripe for massive growth of the reform and conservative movements. But on the other end, I think I mentioned this last year in the context of Russia, the institutions that were preserved, the buildings, and in Poland in particular, under the communist era, are maintained by small groups of largely Holocaust survivors who for decades have maintained a strong tie with whoever was in power, communists or Putin, whoever it is now. So it's complicated. I see there are no neolog communities to my knowledge, outside, unless you might have a small neolog community that is in, of Hungarian expats in an area, but I think it's only, I am sure it's only a Hungarian phenomenon, bizarrely. So just, um, and how many Jews are there in Hungary now? Depends who you ask. The numbers, what I say the numbers were like in a few, in a few thousands in terms of the Jewish community today who were involved. But um, it depends how you measure how many Jews there are. So if I were to measure, for example, in America, we all say there are about 6 million Jews. If you look at synagogue attendance, let's take Kol Nidre, you know, the highest pre-corona, the highest number I'd be surprised if you get one and a half million Jews, right? In attendance out of six million Jews, I'd be surprised. Hungary is similar, but a lot of Jews in America say, oh, I'm very Jewish. I don't have synagogue affiliation. I'm involved in the Jewish Federation. Hungary is different than most other countries in Europe because there is more of an ethnic slash national Jewish identification amongst Hungarian Jews, much more so than in Poland, which is bizarre. There's a lot of Israeli culture that's in that's in, uh, Hung in Budapest, which you don't see in other places in Europe. There are hundreds, maybe even the low thousands of Israelis who are studying medicine and other professions in Hungary as we speak. So it's a very different, um, it's, it's weird, it's, it's unique. Um, I mean, moving, it's you know, Europe. like in Berlin, there are a lot of Israelis who have moved to Berlin. Yep. Are there Israelis moving to Hungary? Or are they just, just visiting, just studying? No, and visiting? A lot of Israelis visiting. I have a, a colleague of mine, a teacher of mine, um, who you might know, Rachel Korzin, who teaches a lot of poetry online. And she's originally, she's born in Israel of Hungarian parents who survived the Holocaust, but she has an apartment in Hungary and she goes back a few times a year. And a lot of Israelis who are, as Tommy Lapid said, right? I, I, I mean, I'm Hungarian. I'm a proud Hungarian. I'm proud of my identity. And you don't really have Polish Jews in Israel now saying that right so i think hungarian jews felt a lot warmer and a lot more a part of things in budapest late 18th early 19th sorry late 19th early 20th century than in poland um you do have a lot of russians in israel today in the modern era who say that you know they like russian culture but they hate russian the soviet system or, or, or the russian system or whatever else um but there's definitely a critical mass in budapest and a few other communities, but mostly in Budapest, that you do not have in any other place in Europe. I mean, if you mathematically take all the Jews in Lithuania and all the Jews in Poland, all the Jews in Austria, all the Jews in Slovakia, all the Jews in the Czech Republic, it's still less than a half or maybe a third of the Jews who are in Budapest. So large numbers, Rabbi, maybe 120,000, maybe even 200,000 who have a Jewish grandparent and therefore would be eligible tomorrow to move to Israel but in the handful of thousands of Jews who do something Jewishly, shall we say, through the community. So here's a question. What is the American Jewish relationship with them? And are there Jewish federations or entities that work with the larger Jewish community in Hungary? It's a good question. There are two organizations that do a lot of work there in, in Budapest. One is the Jewish Agency for Israel. Um, if you give a dollar to the Los Angeles Jewish Federation, I don't know, 25-30% goes overseas, which could be to the Jewish Agency for Israel or the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee. And both of those organizations have a lot of work, uh, community empowerment, young leadership, um, all sorts of programs to teach Hebrew, Israeli culture, prepare people for immigration. So in a sense, those programs are supported by largely American, North American Jewish uh, communal uh, philanthropy. Um, I don't know if there's like a sister relationship between any of the communities there and in America. I'm not sure of that nature, but there's, and you could say that about all Jewish life across Europe, you know, that whether it's Chabad, very powerful and very wealthy in terms of the resources that they have, and the conservative and the reform and the federation, 
uh, the the Jewish Community Feder Jewish Federations of North America organization umbrella organization that those philanthropic dollars are what keeps the Jewish communities alive in Europe today no question outside of France and England, I would probably say. Less Russia today, by the way, because there are a lot of very wealthy Russians who are becoming very involved in their communities again. So next week, we're going to talk about Vienna. Yeah. And bring your strudel. Bring your strudel. And Theodore Herzl, how old was he when he moved to Vienna? Uh, 18 or 19. So he was born 1860. I think it was 19, 1879. So he was Hungar a Hungarian Jew. Yeah. Uh, a liberal one and that's mm -hmm. great well i want to thank you so much this was so interesting as usual and it amazes me how much you prepare for us and you really i really appreciate it i am looking thinking about all this stuff and even to this morning you're adding things for us and thank you so much on behalf of everyone it was fantastic well, but my pleasure but i will say what's first of all i mean yeah i literally added like four or five slides in the past couple of days because I, I made this presentation months ago but the amazing thing about all the stuff a, i put a lot into it and it's a great way for me to get through corona so thank you for allowing me to teach you as well but it's amazing that contemporary events i mean this whole issue of what's going on with russia and ukraine it's dominating our news feeds after corona maybe all over the world and in the midst of all of this is the current prime minister who's you yeah. know taking his country into this very and i my, my hungarian friends could spend hours talking about how upset the liberal friends how upset they are over closing down of soros's university in budapest and of the current regime changing constitution and and you know i'm always reminded of what happened in germany hitler did not take power in a coup hitler was given the reins of power in a very democratic country and it, already become un, a little bit undemocratic in the late 30s with the rise of fascism. But this is a danger that can happen in any democracy. Um, and as we see it unfolding in front of our very eyes, it's not just history, it's not just Jewish memory, it impacts the present. Anyway, I'm going to see you all next week. Part two, stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye. Have a lovely thank you, day. Thank you, Diane. Yalla, bye.